This Parsha podcast is dedicated in honor of my dear friend and longtime podcast listener, Yaakov Yehoshua ben David, who is getting married as I am recording this podcast to Miriam Bat Moshe. On behalf of the entire Parsha podcast family, we wish them to have a wonderful marriage and a hearty Mazal Tov, and may they have a life of happiness, harmony, health, and prosperity. Before we begin, there's a quick programming note. Next week, there will not be a new Parsha podcast, because next week, there isn't a new Parsha. Next week's Shabbos falls out on Pesach, and whenever a Shabbos falls out on a festival, we read, instead of the kind of the next Parsha in the cycle, we read a Torah portion that is related to that particular festival. So next Shabbos, we're going to read about Pesach, not the next installment of Leviticus, Parshas Shemini, that will be read the following week. Now, I want to tell the audience that I really had a great excuse not to do a new Parsha podcast this week. After all, we're getting ready for Pesach, and it's a busy time of the year, and everyone knows that there's so many other things that we need to do. But of course, here at the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, we don't operate like that. And we want to keep the streak alive. We have not missed, thank God, with the help of the Almighty. We haven't missed a new Parsha podcast in seven and a half months. I actually did it while stricken with COVID, while the kids were home from school, during the week of my son's bar mitzvah, during the week, of course, of the Torch fundraiser. Getting ready for Pesach is not going to stop the Parsha podcast train. This is how seriously we take the Parsha podcast here. And therefore, I want to tell you, the audience, if you enjoy the Parsha podcast, do me a favor, share it with a friend. And also, go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. For some reason, our five-star reviews have become a little bit anemic lately, a little sluggish, if you will. We want to change that today. So please give it a five-star review. And as always, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. So our Parsha begins with an outline of how to process the sacrifice. Tzav, command Aaron and his sons regarding how to follow the protocol of processing the Ola, the burnt offering. It is put on the altar and it burns on the altar the entire night. And the fire never leaves the altar and it burns till the morning. And then in the next verse we read that in the morning, the priest ascends up to the altar and takes the ashes that used to be the sacrifice, the elevation offering, and takes it off the altar and places those ashes besides the altar, next to the altar. And then he switches his clothing and he carries the ashes outside of the camp to a clean place. So our Parsha begins with a description of the processing of the Ola offering, of the Ola sacrifice, of the elevation sacrifice. It's burnt the whole night. And then the first thing you do in the morning, you clear away the ashes. You take a special shovel and you dig into the coals and you scoop a shovel full of ashes and you walk down the ramp which is connected, of course, to the altar. And you deposit the ashes near the altar. And the Talmud tells us there was a special place to place the ashes. And in addition, other things like the various feathers of bird sacrifices that were not burnt. And that was placed on the eastern side of the altar. And there was a place designated for it on the ground, on the floor. And what would happen to those ashes the Talmud tells us that these ashes would miraculously be subsumed and absorbed into the ground. So the Kohen, this is the first thing you do in the morning. You take a scoop full of ashes, a shovel full of ashes. You walk down the ramp and place it in the designated spot on the eastern side of the ramp. And it gets swallowed up and absorbed by the floor, by the ground. Well, what about the rest of the ashes that are on top of the altar. You only take a shovel full of it to put next to the altar, next to the ramp. Well, they remained piled up on the altar. And when it was time to clear it off, 
And Rashi tells us this was not a daily activity. Periodically, when it was needed, you clear out the entirety of the ashes that are on top of the altar, and you remove it, and you place it outside the camp. So this is how our Parsha begins, a really interesting part of the daily tabernacle and temple protocol. You clear away the ashes, you take a shovel full of it and put it next to the altar, it gets swallowed up in the ground, and then periodically you clear out the rest of the ashes from on top of the altar. Now the Talmud tells us that clearing off the ashes was a highly coveted activity. All the Kohanim, all the priests wanted to do it. In fact, the Talmud tells us there used to be a race. They would have a first come, first serve rule as to who would be the lucky Kohen to remove the ashes. And the Talmud tells us there was a tragedy and then there was an accident and they changed it to being a lottery system. There was a tragedy. This is a kind of a wild story. The Talmud tells the book of Yoma, page 23a, that there were two Kohanim running neck and neck to go up the ram to clear away the ashes. And one of them lost the race and was so angry, he pulled out a sword, he pulled out a knife, and he stabbed the other person, the other Kohen who had won the race, in his heart. As they say, boy, that escalated quickly. But the story gets even crazier. The father of the young Kohen, who was essentially murdered because he won the race, he rushes to the temple and he sees his son convulsing and dying on the floor. And he makes a very generous, conciliatory announcement. He says, may the death of my son be an atonement for all of you. And then, this is where it gets a little strange. Well, I guess stranger. And then, as his son is dying, he makes an announcement. He says, hey, what about the sword? What about the knife? The knife is still pure. Because the knife didn't touch a dead person because the son's still alive. And isn't that amazing that the knife of the temple is still pure, it didn't become impure, because it would have become impure if it was touching a dead person. And it says the Talmud, this is a reflection of the depressed state of the nation at the time. They were so worried about ritualistic holiness, and they cared more about that than they cared about murder. And then Marshall points out, this is before the destruction of the temple, when the sanctity of life was diminished in the eyes of the people, and the father is more concerned about the purity of the knife than the death of his son. But interestingly, this is not the story that got the Kohanim to change their policy. They view this episode as an aberration. The murderer is clearly mentally unwell. That's not a good reason to change the policy of having a race. Who can get up the ramp first to clear away the ashes? There was a second story. Again, there was a close race down to the finish line, and one of the contestants was shoved off the altar, fell down, and broke his leg. And that, the Kohanim reasoned, is something that is likely to occur again, and they changed it to a lottery system. And that's the Trumas Hadeshin ceremony that begins our Parsha. you got to remove the ashes from on top of the altar, the ashes of Yesterday's sacrifices are removed before we do the first sacrifice of today. So I had some thoughts on this that I wanted to share with you, my dear friends, my dear fellow members of the Parsha Podcast family. Let's start off with a few questions. What is the purpose of this ceremony? It's not to clear away the ashes because you only take a shovel full. So what's the point of doing this? What's the symbolism of this ceremony? Why is it something that is so desirable to the Kohanim? They're racing up and people are so obsessed with doing this that we even have this tragedy and this accident that causes a change in policy. And here's a third question. Tell me if you like this question. The ashes are the remnants of of the sacrifices of yesterday. There's a large animal that is slaughtered. 
And after you slaughter the animal for a sacrifice, you grab the blood and you sprinkle it on the altar and then you divide it up into parts. And they're brought up the ramp to the top of the altar and placed on the fire on top of the altar. And they burn the whole night. And the bulk of the animal disappears, or if you wish, ascends to heaven. And what's left, the remnant, is the ashes. These ashes are the leftovers, if you will, of the sacrifice. And what do we do with the ashes? We take them off the altar and bring them down and place them on the ground near the altar. And they get absorbed into the ground. I don't get it. The sacrifice is supposed to be elevated. In fact, the name of the sacrifice is Ola, Elevation Offering. You take the animal and you elevate it to God. And here, we take part of the animal, and not only we don't elevate it, we actually bring it down. Why are we doing opposite things with a sacrifice? Part of it, we bring up, we elevate it uh, up the ramp, on top of the altar, and then put it on the fire, and it ascends to God. And part of it, the ashes, we take down, off the altar, down the ramp, onto the floor, to the designated spot for the ashes to be absorbed into the ground. Why are we elevating, raising up some parts of the sacrifice and doing the exact opposite to the ashes? So I want to suggest a new approach and one that I think will help us understand sacrifices in general and specifically, what's the deal with the ashes? What do they represent? Why are they so cherished? Why are they brought down and absorbed into the ground. So, of course, a sacrifice is you take an animal and you sacrifice it. Perhaps we can speculate the following. Us humans are a very funny species. We're a hybrid. We have a soul and a body, and these cannot be any more different. The soul, we're told, is holier than the angels. The body, we're told, is less holy, is more mundane, is more physical, is more distant from God than the animals. When we sacrifice the animals as a sacrifice on the altar, that symbolizes the consecration of our own physicality for God. Let's explain. The Mishnah tells us that this world is a prosdar, is a corridor in front of Olamaba, the next world. And here we're supposed to prepare ourselves so that when we arrive at the palace gates, we are ready to enter the next world. The Torah teaches us that this world is transitory. This world is preparatory. Here, we are supposed to prepare ourselves for the eternal life of Olam Abba. Our soul is eternal. Our body is temporary. And they're bound together here in this world by divine decree. And here, we have a very specific job. Here, we must prepare. We must get ready for our real life in Olam Abba. Long-time listeners know that I have a pet peeve. I don't like calling Olam Abba afterlife, as if it's some sort of addendum that's annexed, appendaged to this world. It's like an extra bonus. This world is life, and that world is the afterlife. I like to view this world as pre-life, and the world to come the eternal world as life. But that's what we're here for. I think sacrifices show us how this is done. Is our body, our physicality, our internal animal, is that holy? 
or is just our soul holy? I think that this question is the absolute epicenter of our free will. This is the epicenter of our life's conflict. This is the number one choice and decision that we have to make. If we choose to live a life that's optimized for the next world, we view this world as a corridor, we're trying to get to a destination, but our goal is the afterlife, Olam Abba. Well, then we view the body and its world and its agenda, the temporary world, as being there to enable us to facilitate the goal of getting to the next world. If the body is oriented around helping the soul prepare for the afterlife, for Olam Abba, then the body itself becomes elevated too. If it enables the soul, it too gets influenced by the soul and becomes holy. And of course, in our pursuit of this goal, we have an enemy. We have something that's trying to blockade it. We have an obstacle, and that's called the Yetzirah. And if we can distill the objective of the Yetzirah down to one goal, it is to make a person view the body and its world and its agenda as an end, not as a means. So is the body holy or is it not holy? The answer is it depends. If you listen to the Yetzirah, everything is oriented around the temporary world. The body becomes more and more animalistic. It drags the soul down with it, and the body indeed is an impediment to our spiritual growth, not something which aids it. The objective of the soul, the objective of Torah, is that we place the body and the soul in their proper assignments. The body becomes a helper to the soul. It implements the agenda of the soul as a horse obeys its rider. And the soul can make its way down the corridor towards Olam dragging the body along with it. When we sacrifice an animal, we elevate it. We offer it to God. We are symbolizing this idea. Our objective is to take our own internal animalistic body and consecrate it and elevate it for God as well. That is the meaning behind sacrifices in general. And I think if we study what happens to the animal from the beginning to the end, we see an entire framework of what our life is really about. We take an animal and we bring it as a sacrifice. The first thing we do is we kill the animal. What does the animal represent? It represents everything physical. Everything that can be used For sin, bad character, bad habits, physicality. First thing we do is we kill it. And we declare to all, this is not my essence. I'm not a body, I'm a soul. This world is the pre-life. The world of the soul, it's not the afterlife, it's life itself. The body is just a tool for the soul. It's a garment for the soul. It's the horse to the soul's rider. The Yetzirah, of course, spins some fiction. He wants us to believe that our body in this world, this temporary world, is the one that matters. The first thing we do is to view the animal, so to speak, our internal animal, in general, holistically, and you kill it. We must first dispense with that fiction. But what now? What's the next Stage, we have this dead animal, and we're not done. It's not enough to kill it and declare that's not our essence. No, now it's time to elevate it. Now it's time to make the animal, the physicality, our own animalistic self, make it part of the team. It's time to align the body, the animal that's within us, align it with the agenda of the soul. The physicality that we have, it's not just a danger that we must sidestep, overcome, and triumph over. Our physicality is also an opportunity. It could be 
useful and helpful and productive. But in order to make it productive, we have to take the animal, so to speak, and separate it into its parts. If it's one glob of unidentifiable mass, it's not very helpful. Before we elevate the sacrifice, we have to separate it into its different parts. So again, according to our approach, the animal, the body, the physicality, the tools and aspects of this world must be identified and labeled and separated into discrete entities before they can be raised on the altar. In order to make the most of your body, you have to know what you're dealing with. And only then can you consecrate it to God. So after you slaughter the animal, after you declare as a whole, in general, that your identity is that of the angelic soul and not of the animalistic body, it's time to break down that body into its parts. We have to develop self-awareness, self-knowledge, a catalog of our animalistic components and separate them. Once they're separated, once we have a comprehensive knowledge of the various forces operating within our animalistic self, now it's time to elevate it to God. Now it's time to dedicate our body to the Almighty. And like we said, the body can be elevated and made holy as an aid to the soul. And that's represented by taking the parts of the animal sacrifice and elevating it to the top of the altar. The Gona Vilna told us, everything that we do, everything, can be a mitzvah. We can be doing mitzvahs 24-7, 365 for our whole life. But wait a minute, if you go to sleep, you're not doing a mitzvah by sleeping. Everybody needs to sleep. That's not a mitzvah. Wrong. If you say I'm sleeping so that I have strength to worship God, to do kindness, to give charity, to study Torah, to do mitzvos, then the sleep, the behavior of the body, is elevated and made holy. And that becomes a mitzvah. You could have eight hours of mitzvah as you sleep. Well, what about eating? Everyone needs to eat. Yes. But if I say I'm eating so that way I have strength and energy, I have the fuel I need, to get my soul down the corridor towards Olam Abba, that eating has been elevated and now it's a mitzvah. What about relaxation? Relaxation, well, that's not a mitzvah. Well, it depends. If you make it an end unto its own, well, then you're living as a body. You're implementing the agenda of the body. We would even call that a sin. But if you need a nap, need to relax, need a vacation, need some leisure, because you know that to advance your spiritual agenda, it's time, it's necessary for you to relax a little bit, that relaxation is a mitzvah. So you can have two people doing identical things. For one, it's a mitzvah. For one, it's a sin. If you do it, the physical behavior, to advance the spiritual behavior or the spiritual agenda, that is a mitzvah. If you do it because you are a body, living as a body, ignoring the agenda of the soul, well, that's a sin. When we take the animal, which, like we said, that is an allegory for our body, and we kill it, i.e., we say, this is not who I am, and then we divide it up into its various parts, and then we elevate it onto the altar, We are saying, even my physicality, I want to be holy, to be dedicated and consecrated for God. The eating, sleeping, family life, relaxation, leisure, all those things, let's make them holy. That's the sacrifice. In the Shema, we say that we are supposed to love God with all our hearts. Bechol levavecha, with all your hearts. So Rashi there tells us, quoting from the Talmud, we have two hearts. We have a physical heart, we have a spiritual heart. 
We have a Yetzer Tov, we have a Yetzer Ra. We have to love God with every component of our existence. Even the physicality should be made spiritual, should be consecrated and dedicated for God. The world hinges on three things. Torah, worship of God, which is a code name for sacrifices, and kindness. And Reb Chaim Velazhner explains, and I'll say this quickly, and there's a lot here, the world hinges on a connection between this world and heaven. This world cannot exist if it's divorced from the spiritual world. And the things that bind the two worlds together are Torah, sacrifices, and kindness. And he explains, Torah and sacrifices both foster a connection between these two worlds, but in opposite ways. Torah is you take a heavenly Torah, the heavenly will of God, and you make it practical for this world. You apply it to this world. What happens when my ox gores your ox? What is the will of God in that scenario? You're taking the heavenly will of God and applying it to the mundane circumstances of this world. Moshe goes up to heaven and takes the Torah from the heaven, extracts the heavenly Torah, and brings it down here. Torah is thus a connection between heaven and earth. Sacrifices also form a connection, but one that goes in the opposite direction. Sacrifices are about taking the physical, the mundane, and elevating it and making it spiritual. You take the animal, and you consecrate it for God. You take your physicality, your own animalistic self, the body, and you make it holy. You take what could have been an instigator of sin, and you consecrate it to God. So we have this animal, and we put it on the altar, after we slaughtered it, divided it up into its parts, and it's in the fire the whole night. This is the consecration of the physicality to God. And you wake up in the morning, and you go check out how things are going. And the large animal that we put on the fire late yesterday afternoon is mostly gone. There's just some ashes left. Some of the animal has disappeared. It was elevated. It ascended to heaven. But some of the stuff did not ascend to heaven. They remain. And that's the ashes. Perhaps we can speculate further the following. When you consecrate your physicality, your animalistic self, to God, when you marshal the entirety of yourself, both hearts, every fiber of your being to God, to the mission of the soul, to getting down the corridor and readying yourself for the palace gates. When you do that, there are two different ways that you deal with the physicality. The large bulk of it you make disappear. Perhaps we can say you dissociate yourself from it. It ascends to heaven. What's left is the ashes. These ashes used to be part of a robust animal, but now that they have spent a night in the fire, all they are is a pile of singed ashes. What do these ashes represent? So here's what we want to suggest. Ashes appear in several places in Jewish literature. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 27, Abraham tells God, when he's trying to intercede on behalf of the sinners of Sodom and Gomorrah, he says to God, please forgive me if I speak to you, I am but dust and ashes. Vanochi afar va'efer. Abraham compares himself to ashes. Says the Talmud, in the merit that Abraham said that I am but dust and ashes, his descendants, i.e. the Jewish people, merited two mitzvahs, the ashes of the red heifer and the dust of the sota. So what do we see? Ashes in three places. We have the ashes of the sacrifice that was burning the whole night. We have Abraham declaring that he is but dust 
and ashes, and with the ashes of the red heifer that is sprinkled upon the people who became impure, and those ashes render them pure again. I think there's something really deep going on over here. The animal was a mass of physicality. And after it was slaughtered and separated into parts and elevated on the altar and burned the whole night, that physicality was reduced to ashes. I think these ashes are the spark of holiness that the animal always had, but it didn't know. Abraham is ashes. His father was Terach, one of the worst people in history. He was someone who was willing to give his son over to be killed, according to the Midrash, because his son refused to worship idols. But what happened to Abraham? Abraham was consecrated to God. He went through a crucible of fire. He purified himself, and all that was left was that one point of purity, Abraham, correctly viewed himself as ashes. His father was a terrible guy. But he had this one point of holiness within him that was totally overshadowed by all his evil. But Abraham underwent the process, the same process that the sacrifice does, of elevating the physicality and sifting it down until that point of unrestrained holiness was revealed. The animal had a spark of holiness within it. And that is swallowed up amidst an overwhelming mass, a hunk of physicality. But via this long process of being slaughtered and the blood sprinkled on the altar and separated the parts and on the fire the whole night, that point of purity was isolated. And that's the ashes. Abraham is ashes. What's left of the sacrifice is ashes. And it's the red heifer's ashes that confer purity. The red heifer is a gargantuan animal of impurity and rebellion against God. It's red, like Esau. It is disobedient. It is recalcitrant. It is rebellious. One of the conditions of this red heifer is that it cannot have a yoke on it. It refuses to submit itself to God. But you do this purification process and you burn it and you distill it down to its point of holiness and those ashes are such a concentration of holiness that they can transform the impure to becoming pure. What we want to speculate here is that ashes represent the isolated point of holiness that have been extracted specifically from the thing that is most antithetical to that holiness. Out of the physical animal that sacrificed come these ashes. Out of Terach comes the ashes of Abraham. Out of the red heifer come those special ashes, the only thing that can take a person who's impure and render them pure. The sacrifice spent the whole night simmering in the fire of God, and now it's just these ashes. And what do we do with these ashes? They too must be elevated, but they're elevated in a different manner. Unlike the mass of the animal that we dissociate from, we send it heavenly or heavenly word, the ashes we don't dissociate from. To the contrary, we take the singed parts and we bring them back down off the altar and we place them on the floor and we allow them to get absorbed into the floor. We try to reintegrate those ashes back into ourselves. We start off with coal. It's a mess. It's dirty, it's physical, and it undergoes this process of distillation until you have a diamond and that you want to keep. We start off with an animal. 
And the sacrifice and everything we do to this animal is this process of discovering the ashes, the isolated diamond that was always there within it. And once we find those ashes, once we find this diamond, we don't want to discard it. It's too valuable to lose. It's too critical for us. We take it down off the altar and we try to absorb the concentrated point of holiness back within us. The Midrash tells us that we have two forces operating within us. We have the Yetzer Tov, good inclination, and the Yetzer Hara, evil inclination. Which one of those two is better? Says the Midrash, Vayar Elohim as kol asher asavi hinei tov me'od. The Almighty saw everything that he made, and behold, it was tov, good, me'od, exceedingly good. Says the Midrash, tov ze yetzer tov. When it describes good, God saw that everything he made was good, that's a reference to the good inclination. Me'od, exceedingly, inordinately good. Ze yetzer hara. This is a reference to the yetzer hara. There is a point within the impurity that is so much brighter than the Yetzir Tov. The Talmud tells us that in the future, the Omai is going to take the Yetzir Hara and slaughter it. And the Talmud describes the book of Sukkah, page 52a, the Omai is going to slaughter in front of the righteous, in front of the wicked, everyone's going to be crying. But what this means is that there's a process of slaughtering the Yetzir Hara, not killing it. Slaughtering is the process of taking something that was not kosher, a living animal, and making it kosher via a slaughtering process. There's something so wonderful about the Yetzahara that via a certain process, we can unlock and make it holy or discover the holiness that was within it. After it's been slaughtered, after it's been separated, after it's been on the fire the whole night... We have finally unlocked that one point of holiness. And those ashes, that holiness is something that we want to maintain and not lose. I think there are many valuable lessons in this framework. First of all, it reminds us what our mission in life is. Our mission is to get our soul down the corridor to Olam Abba, and the body's there to help. We have to do whatever we can to get all of our components on board, get the body and soul working in tandem. Well, how do we do that? How do we overcome the Yetzirah who tells us that no, your body is your essence, this world is the only one that matters? The first thing we got to do is kill the animal, i.e. dissociate or completely dispel with the fiction that our body is our essence. We have an animal within us, we have an angel within us, the very first thing we got to do is to kill the animal. And then we have to separate it. We have to know what exactly is it comprised of. And then we have to dedicate that to God. And most of the time that demands dissociation. But some of what remains, maybe a shovel full of it, that's a kernel of intense purity that was always present within the physicality, and I would venture to say that the more impure the animal, so to speak, in general is, the brighter that point of holiness is. If Abraham's father wasn't the biggest idolater in the world, maybe he sold insurance and minded his own business. Well, maybe Abraham's ashes would not be as bright as they are. But those ashes... That point of holiness that emerges after going through the fire is to be cherished. It's something that the Kohanim would race up the ramp to try to get to. That must not be discarded. We don't want to lose that. We want it integrated and absorbed within us. Let's get to this week's and you. And because next week we're not going to have a new Parsha podcast, and it's going to be Pesach. I figured apropos of sacrifices and Pesach, we have a special Pesach edition, Passover edition of the A&Q. 
And here's the question. As we know in temple times, the day before Pesach, you would offer what's called the carbon Pesach, the paschal sacrifice, the paschal lamb. And then you would eat it the eve of Pesach, the night that we have the Seder night. But what's most interesting about this is that the paschal offering must be offered before Pesach. Why? Doesn't it make sense to offer the Pesach offering on Pesach itself? We bring sacrifices on Yom Kippur, and those are sacrificed on Yom Kippur, and every day we have those days sacrifice on that day, and the Shabbos sacrifice is on Shabbos, and the Rosh Hashanah sacrifice is on Rosh Hashanah, and the Shavuot sacrifice is on Shavuot, and the Sukkot sacrifices are on Sukkot. But somehow, if you wait until Pesach itself, and you want to bring the Pesach sacrifice, it's too late. You have to bring it before Pesach. Now granted, you eat it on Pesach, but you must offer it as a sacrifice before Pesach. And the question is why? Why not do it on Pesach? Why must you do the Pesach sacrifice before Pesach for it to be valid? If you have an answer, email me, rabbiwobi at gmail.com. Last week we had a question as to why this very valuable lesson that Rashi teaches us in the beginning of Parshas Vayikra, that whenever there's a break between paragraphs, that is because the Almighty gave Moshe time to think about it, to ruminate upon it, to dwell upon it, to absorb the message before going on. Why, we asked, is that taught at the beginning of Leviticus? Why not say in Exodus when Moshe gets all the laws and there are many breaks and like Rashi tells us, the reason why Moshe had those breaks, or the reason why the Torah has those breaks, it's to reflect the fact that the Almighty stopped and allowed Moshe to think about it and chew it over and ruminate upon it before going further. Why are we told this in Leviticus, not say the first time that that phenomenon appears? So several of the listeners gave a similar answer. I want to read what my friend Ari wrote. I think it could be important for many of us to hear this idea specifically at the beginning of the book of Vayikra, Leviticus. Because if we think the content of this book maybe does not apply to us as much, for whatever reason, perhaps we should think again. Leviticus talks a lot about sacrifices, the laws are quite foreign, very ritualistic, we don't have a temple, we don't know what these things look like. And we may think, Vayikra, well that's kind of a snooze fest, wake me up when things get interesting. But it's not. And therefore, at the very beginning, the first verse of Vayikra, Rashi reminds us, before you move on, think about it a little bit, maybe you will discover something amazing. And of course, that's what we try to do here at Torch and the Torch Center on the Parsha Podcast. And you know what? If you like it, email me, rabbiwobajibba.com. And like I mentioned at the top, give us a five-star review. Have an amazing Shabbos, a happy and kosher Pesach. Please, God, we will speak, not next week, with a new episode. But in two weeks, until then, all the best and take care.